chapter 12 with Peter being miraculously released from prison and the church not uh, believing that their own prayers were answered and then we saw the death of Herod uh, for the uh, uh, refusing to give God the honor and glory and taking the honor and glory upon himself and so now we begin to see the mission of the church get started if you will uh, with the Gentiles now of course Peter uh, went to Cornelius and, and his friends and family preached the gospel. We know the Holy Spirit fell on them the same as it fell on the Jews. And so uh, they became part of the, uh, the church, if you will. But we don't see a lot happening as far as from the main church in Jerusalem of people going out into the 
Gentile world, if you will. There may have been some going on, but we don't read much about that. And so this week we pick up, we see that there is a church uh, in Antioch, and so uh, it is going to begin to send people out, uh, missionaries out to spread the gospel uh, to Gentiles, but not just in that area, but to travel throughout the world. We're going to see them get on a boat for the first time and go to another area to preach the gospel. And so we see this spread of the gospel begin. So uh, we'll just look at probably the first, uh, well, we'll see how far we get tonight. Uh, try to get to verse 23 tonight, and then we'll uh, look at the rest of it the next week. But let's begin in verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaim, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they tell the Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their ministers. And so we see this church at Antioch, and we have certain prophets called out. Now, uh, the only ones that we continue to read about are Barnabas and Saul. Uh, these others, uh, we don't necessarily hear anything else about um, this, uh, but we also see here the diversity of the church, if you will. So we have this Gentile church, and we have this group of people. Of course, you've got Saul uh, that is a, a Pharisee, and then we have Barnabas, who was um, um, a Cyprian Jew, and he was a Jewish person from the diaspora, from the spreading out uh, of the Jewish people um, back in the Old Testament when they were spread out to the lands for disobedience. And so uh, we've talked before that uh, somebody like Barnabas or the Jews from that dispersion would be more apt to speak and witness to the Gentiles about Jesus than Jews from Jerusalem necessarily would, with the exception of Saul, who we know that God has called to be the apostle of the Gentiles. But the reason that is is because these are areas where these Jewish people grew up. So they knew the Gentile customs. They interacted with the Gentiles. They spoke the language. And so uh, they already had an end, if you will. They uh, uh, knew how things worked with them. And so who better able to be able to witness to them, at least initially, than a Jewish person that lives in that area? Now, of course, you have Saul here, who's a Pharisee. And so he knows the law. He knows the Old Testament well. And so he is also teaching, and he is guiding them in the things to teach. But what eventually needs to happen? And this is interesting, and, and uh, I, you know, I've never thought, thought through mission work. Any mission work I've done has, has involved working on buildings that have been here in the United States. And, of course, Teresa has been overseas to several different places. But, you know, the, the point of commentators here is, what should happen with missionaries is they should send to these other areas and go into the big cities where you have a concentration of people and then witness to those people. And as those people get saved, train <coughs> those people. And then those people will go out into the outer areas outside the city and witness to their own people. Right. And so why is that? because they would have a better opportunity of reaching them That's right. than you would. That's right. And so, again, that's even normal today, if you will. Uh, we've talked about it before with work, with our various work backgrounds. Uh, you know, uh, Mitchell worked in construction. And so when he goes to a job on a construction site, uh, there would be people that he could talk to that if I showed up in a uniform, they wouldn't have anything to do with me, right? right. 
Right. Uh, we can relate to him too. She witnesses her co workers all the time, have a prayer for her to this co worker. Charles worked at Snapper uh, and worked on lawnmowers and things. There are people that he could witness to that I couldn't. And then again, uh, y'all would not be able to go up to a police officer and be able to witness like I probably could. And on and on we could go through uh, and see. And so, uh, what would happen? Well, God sent someone to us, we get saved, and then we go out into our areas. And, and again, a lot of times when we think of missions, we think of going to other countries. But as I said before, your work, if you still work, that's your mission. Right. Um, if you maybe you don't work, but you some of you may go to like a Patty used to go to the senior center and do things. And so the senior center, guess what? That's her place of mission. That's her mission field. Country. And so where we're at, even if you sit at home, you know, Carrie and Teresa both work from home, but they're on the phone with people, they're interacting. That is a mission field. And so we still do these things today. But a lot of times missionaries or mission uh, groups will try to send people out about into the Areas that are densely are not densely populated, but sparsely populated, and sometimes they don't have good results. Why? Because these people are not going to hear them. But if they go into the densely populated areas, right. witness people get saved, they train, and then those people will be able to go in those sparsely populated areas and be able to be better witnesses. And so we see some of that here. And that's a reason, too, we have this diverse group. Again, we have Simeon, who's called Niger, and they believe that he was a black man. And so he's probably from Ethiopia and heard the gospel, maybe even from the Ethiopian eunuch that we read about back in eight or, or, or the chapter 8 or, or somewhere else. And he's come here, and then you've got Lucius, who's from Cyrene. And um, then you have Manan, uh or Manian, who has been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, Herod the Tetrarch, if you remember reading your Bible, is the one that had John the Baptist arrested and beheaded. This guy grew up with him, so that means either they were friends or maybe they were some distant relative, but he ran around with him. Right. And so you have a wealthy man here with these others that aren't wealthy. And so we have this mix. And God is going to use us mix. Of course, we don't hear anything else about these others, but I imagine that they went and witnessed to the people they could witness to, just as Saul and Barnabas did. But as we go along, get more in the book of Acts, because Luke was with Paul mostly, that everything starts trending toward Paul, if you will, as we get further along in the book of Acts. So we see here in this church, and it says they minister to the Lord. And so uh, they're uh, worshiping God. They're witnessing there. They're having church. And we see that they fasted. And the Holy Ghost, during this period of time of fasting, uh, said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I called them. And so this group, whether all of them or certain ones in the church, got a message from the Holy Spirit, and they came, and guess what? They were all, they all had the same message. Barnabas and Saul, separate them. I've got a work for them to do. And so they called them out, and, and, and I'm sure that Saul and Barnabas got the same message because they have to know that they're going to go, and these other people have to know that they're going to send them. Uh, you know, I have... I had people on before that uh, I've dealt with uh, here and, and in other churches. I, I've had a couple of folks that, like, you know, I, I, I feel uh, years ago I had somebody say, well, God's called me to preach. Okay, that's great. When he tells me, then we'll do something. Right. That doesn't mean you have to wait to get a title and start preaching. Right. You can go be a witness, but, um, you know, again, when God says something in the church, I, as a pastor, he can convert it through me. He should. Right. We should be in agreement. We should be, and we've had things like that that have happened. Where we've been in agreement. Uh, somebody come up and said, hey, and I said, well, yeah, the Lord's been dealing with me about that too. And so we can move. But again, uh, there should be some agreement when things like this happen. 
We should know, uh, and the Holy Spirit should guide and should direct in these things. And so, uh, again, they've been separated and called. And in verse 3, it says, when they had fasted and prayed, what did they do? They laid their hands on them and sent them away. Now, laying their hands on them didn't imbue them with any special power. It didn't confirm them. All it did is just show that, hey, we agree that the Holy Spirit has called y'all out. Right. And we're laying hands on y'all to uh, so that we all recognize this calling. You see, that's what happens with ordination now. What happens? People, uh, there's there's a time of prayer. There should be a time of fasting. We don't do that enough nowadays. But then they come together and they lay hands on the one that is being ordained. Mm -hmm. Why? They're just all recognizing the call of God. They all say, you know what? He says he's called to God, and we pray about it, we fast, and we agree he's been called by God. And so we're laying hands on him to send him forward, to do what God has called him to do. You see, too often, a lot of times in churches, uh, they'll gather together and lay hands on somebody saying, we're sending you forth, and that's the wrong thing. It's the Holy Spirit that's sending right. forth, and they're just agreeing with you. That's right. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how it should be. Uh, but there should be that recognition. And so again, we see this. They laid hands on him, and they sent them away. And so again, they are going out to begin to witness to the Gentiles. And, and Antioch here becomes a hub, if you will, this church of sending missionaries out to the Gentiles. And so in verse 4, it says, They being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed from Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now remember, Barnabas is from where? He's from Cyprus. And so, again, Barnabas has an end. So uh, maybe Barnabas has said, Hey, let's go to Cyprus. And the Holy Ghost like that, you can go to Cyprus. So not only should we recognize some, a calling on somebody's life, but we should also recognize a calling of where they're supposed to go. Right. Because remember, Paul later on, he's going to ask to go somewhere, and the Holy Ghost is going to say, Nope, don't want you to go there. Yep. I've got somewhere else I'm ready to go. And so, again, all of it is being in tune with the Holy Ghost. And so they sell the Cyprus, obviously with the blessing of God, and when they're at uh, Salamis, they preach the word of God, and notice, in the synagogue of the Jews. And so where do they go first? They go into the synagogue. So again, you have this Jewish people that are in the dispersion. They have set up synagogues in these areas, and so naturally they're going to the synagogues first. Why? Because the synagogues already know about God. Right. And so what better place to begin to go in and witness to them because remember, the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to all of us, but he's their Messiah. Right. And so they go in to tell them of their Messiah. As a matter of fact, Paul in Romans in the later chapters uh, in several places talks about to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Why? Because the Jewish people are God's chosen people who are supposed to be what? A light unto the Gentiles. And so they go into the synagogues. And you know, Paul, even knowing that he is called to the Gentiles, still, we read through Acts, what happens when they get to a new town? They go into the synagogue. All right. And so we see that begin here. So they go in and it says they preach the word of God and they also had John to their minister. So John Mark, you remember that's his mama's house is where they were praying when Peter was in prison. It's going to be executed. And so John Mark goes with them and we don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing, but the Bible doesn't tell us that John Mark was called. Mm. It tells us Barnabas and Saul were set apart. And John Mark went with them. And so he was their assistant, if you will. And so let's look on at verse 6. It says, When they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, 
they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was of the which was with the deputy or the proconsul of the country who was a Sergius Paulus, and so he's a Roman, and he was a prudent man or a wise man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear a word of God. And so we have this man that has heard these stories or heard word about this Jesus, this Jesus Christ, and they, he wants to hear. He's a wise man. He wants to find out more about this person, Jesus. But then we have Linus, the sorcerer, again, who is this bar Jesus, in verse 8, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now he's been with him for a while. He is some sorcerer or some magician. Now that doesn't mean that he did magic tricks. Maybe he was demon possessed. Or maybe he was a necromancer, one that spoke to the dead. He's Jewish. Bar Jesus, that's a Jewish name. That means son of Jesus. And that word Jesus is, is actually a, a Joshua. So son of Joshua, and so he's Jewish, and yet what does the law of the Old Testament say? Not to be messing with this magic, not to be messing with sorcery, not to be a necromancer, one that speaks with the dead. Right. And yet he's doing it. And so at every turn, they're trying to speak to this pro council, and yet this guy's trying to argue. They're not telling the truth. Don't listen to them. What they're feeding you is not true, it's false, and yet they continue to preach this word. And then verse 9, it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will I not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And so Paul just gets the point where he's had enough of them. He does that later on with a demon-possessed woman, too. He has enough, and he just casts that demon out. But here, he, he has enough. He's trying to preach the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man keeps interfering. Now notice here it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul. So from this point on, we know Saul is Paul. Now, he may have already had this name Paul. That could have been the name that he used when he dealt with the Romans that was out in the Gentile world. And you go back and look in history at this time, a lot of Jewish people also had a Gentile-sounding name, if you will, that they would use in commerce and business. And so Saul, uh, possibly this name Paul was one that he already had, but we don't know for sure. But how it is, from then on, he's called Paul. And again, the Bible tells us what? He is filled with the Holy Ghost. So he just doesn't see this man, he gets tired of him and says, I need to do something about this guy. No, he is filled with the Holy Ghost and he recognizes what's going on here. He recognizes that this man is interfering with a surrogate Paulus that wants to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he calls him out on it. And you know, Paul doesn't pull any punches. That's one thing I like about Paul. Paul tells it like it is. Even when you read his books in the New Testament, Paul just tells it like it is. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He just says, hey, this is it. And so he lays it out. And so he calls him out and says, oh, full of all subtlety and, and, and mischief. You're a child of the devil. You're an enemy of all righteousness. You need to quit perverting the ways of the Lord. You need to stop this. Mm. And so it says in verse 11, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Isn't it interesting that Paul called for him to be blind? Because what happened to Paul back in Acts chapter 9? God blinded him. Right. What happened while Paul was blind? He saw Jesus, and he saw the truth. He saw that he was fighting against God, so maybe the Holy Ghost uh, 
empowered Paul or encouraged him to call out blindness on this man because Paul saw the truth in his blindness, and maybe this man would see the truth in his blindness. Right. As we said with Paul, was it not the same with us who were blind in our sin mm. until the Lord opened our eyes to the truth? And so this man is suddenly blind and he walking around for someone to lead him by the hand. And so he's blind for a season. Exactly how long it's going to happen, we don't know. But these things aren't just done for the sake of doing. God has a purpose in everything he does. Amen. And in verse 12 it says, Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, I want us to see here, too, in this verse, and it's important. It says, And the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. And so it's not just that. Remember when Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish, and then the next day the people came up and said, Hey, where'd you go? And he said, Oh, they'll read you all because you want some breakfast. I'm paraphrasing. Because I fed you. You want to see another miracle. You're not really interested in what I have to say. You just want to see what I can do. But with Sergius Paulus here, it's different. Yes, he saw the miracle, but the miracle was on top of the word that he heard. How do I know that? Again, it says the deputy, when he saw, verse 12, what was done, believed, but listen, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So it wasn't just the fact that this guy that was, had been a counselor to him or had been telling him, don't listen to them, is blind and he saw that happen, but it's also on top of the teaching that he had heard about Jesus. And what did that cause in that man to be blind do? Well, it confirmed the teaching of Jesus being all powerful. And so he believed. What does that mean? He got saved. So we have another Roman get saved. Amen. Even higher up than the last one. You know, a lot of times they call Christianity the doctrine or the, or the religion of the poor people. Mm. You ever heard that before? Mm -mm. That's what they call it. They call it all throughout history. Ah, Christianity, I said, that's the poor people's religion. The Sergius Paulus wasn't poor. Cornelius wasn't poor. Drew and Kathy wasn't poor. Mm. It's got nothing to do with money. It's got to do with hearts being changed. Amen, amen. So we see that here. So this man gets saved. Look at verse 13. Now when Paul and his company lose from Paphos, in other words, they get through there, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So something happened along the way, and John decided this missionary stuff was not for him, and he returned back home. Hmm. Now later on, Paul and Barnabas get into a little heated dispute about this situation. And so we don't know exactly what happened to cause John Mark to return back home, but he left them and didn't go anymore. Again, maybe that goes back to the fact that he wasn't called by the Holy Ghost Amen. at the beginning of this chapter. Barnabas and Saul were, but he wasn't. So he goes back, they leave, in verse 14, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Sidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And again, they go into the synagogue and they sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, stay on. And so it was common for a synagogue to have teachers that would travel around, and when they would come to the synagogue, they would either let them know, or they would be recognized that they were teachers. And I imagine Paul still wore something to represent him as a Pharisee. You know, 
I think when we read the Bible, I don't recall him ever unbecoming a Pharisee. Mm. That, if I can say it that way. You read anything, Mitch? I mean, as far as we know, I've never thought about it. But I guess he stayed a Pharisee, even though he was, you know, follower of Jesus. There were a few that followed. But maybe he wore some garment or something that they recognized him. But anyway, they asked him to speak. Very common for this to happen. A teacher would come. And they would ask him to say a few words. They weren't expecting what they got here, I guarantee you. Mm. So then Paul stood up, verse 16, and beckoning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. In other words, listen. The God, and then he begins to recite their history. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers. And so again, they're familiar with this. They're chosen by God. God's chosen people set apart, not because of anything they did, but just because of God's mercy and grace. This is mm -hmm. same salvation, your salvation, nothing because God looked down and said, well, hey, you're a pretty good person. I think I'm going to save you. Because, right. boy, I wouldn't be saved right now. That was the case. He came down and said, oh, Greg looks pretty good. I, I, he wouldn't have said that. Greg's the best. <laughs> Greg, black boy or something. My goodness. So they're called out people. And so he said, listen, we were, our fathers were chosen and exalted when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a an high arm he brought them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. So he put up with their junk in the wilderness. And when he destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. Remember, that's the land that he excuse me, promised them. And so he's saying, listen, we got the land. We God gave us what he promised he was going to give us. The land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan, the land where God said, told Abram, said, stop and look north, south, east, and west, as far as the eye can see. Mm -hmm. All this is going to belong to your descendants. Right. And they got it. And so he, he's showing them again, what is he doing? He is leading up, just like we've seen before, speaking about God. And then it's going to transition just like Peter did to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's letting them know the history, letting them know that he knows the history. He is aware of all these things. He is a teacher. And he's going to transition to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he divided the land a lot, verse 20. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And so again, he's going through and giving this history up to the point of the kings. Why is he doing that? Because remember what promise did God make King David? He'd always have a man. He'd always have one of his kin sit on the throne. Ultimately leading to who? Jesus. The Messiah. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so he's related to him, and so it's one of David's kin that's always going to sit on the throne. And so Paul is doing this with intention, what? To point them toward Jesus. You see, our history is all leading to what happened in Jerusalem several years ago with this man called Jesus. Amen. And so that's where he's pointing. And so describing again the kings and then get to David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, Psalm 89, 20, which shall fulfill all my will. And here he kind of caps it, if you will, in verse 23. 
of this man's seed hath God according to his promise. Now, look what he's doing. This is God that said this. This is God that made this arrangement. It's not anything I made up. It's not anything. All the stuff you heard about in Jerusalem, they didn't make this stuff up. All of this is from God. Right. It's important that they get this across and they understand that. All of it is from God raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Hmm. And so raised unto Israel the promised Messiah, the promised one that is to come. The one born of a virgin, that's Jesus. Hmm. Let them know, didn't make this up. That's still important for us today when we talk to people. You know, I hear people all the time. I've had people tell me, I, I've read it before. Oh, oh, that religion's just a crutch. Your Christianity is just a crutch. You just needed something to get you through this life. Mm -mm. And folks, I tell them, some people may have been looking for a crutch. I wasn't. Mm. I'm honest. Folks, I was perfectly happy in my sin. I was perfectly happy going to bars. I was perfectly happy getting drunk. I was perfectly happy running around doing all that stuff. I was happy with all of that. I wasn't looking for a crutch. I wasn't looking for God. But he was looking for me. Amen. Amen. Right? And so it's important that we tell them it's not a crutch. It's not something, you know, all of us. If you look at people, everybody, even atheists, they have to worship something. Right. Wiccans go out and worship the trees. Satanists, well, they say they don't worship Satan, but I still ain't figured out how they separate <laughs> calling themselves Satanists and not worshiping Satan. That doesn't make right. sense. Right? Atheists even worship the fact that they don't think there's a God. <laughs> they say it's not a religion, but it is a religion. As a matter of fact, they created buildings and have meetings much like we do on Sunday morning, but they do it on another day and they just listen to rock music and celebrate the fact that they don't have a religion. <laughs> Somebody ought to record it and kind of show it to them compared to a church or it's not about time. They might find out the other day. See, folks, we were designed to worship. Right. We were designed to worship <clears throat> God. But because of the fall, there's a hole there. Mm -hmm. And we try to fill that hole with stuff. Right. But the only way that hole really gets filled is with Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what we have to let people know. It's not a crutch. It's not uh, something for that, but it's an experience. It's a life. It's life changing. Why do you know that Jesus is really alive? Because I'm changed. I'm different than I was. Amen. Still not perfect. Still growing. Still have a lot of faults and a lot of errors when I sin. But I'm different. And that's the point of what Paul is doing here. He's showing them, pointing them to Jesus, pointing them to the way, pointing them to the one that is the Messiah that was promised. Right. Doing what it was that they were supposed to be doing all along, pointing people to God. And so that's what he's doing here. So we'll stop right there tonight and we'll pick up um, the rest of his message here uh, next week and take a look at that. All right? All right.